Even decades later, the surveillance image above remains etched in the minds of the millions who are familiar with the James Bolger case. To those who aren't familiar, the scene looks harmless enough. Two boys leading a toddler, one holding his hand as they make their way through a normal shopping mall in Boodle, England on February 12, 1993. The older boys, John Venables and Robert Thompson, seem like they could be the brothers of the toddler. James Bulger, as some bystanders thought in the mall that day. But they weren't. Instead, they were the toddler's abductors and, soon, his killers. Within hours of that surveillance image being captured that afternoon, 10-year-olds John Venables and Robert Thompson had tortured 2-year-old James Bulger to death. And in the time between when that image was captured and when James Bulger was killed in a railway embankment, a few miles away, the three boys had been seen walking around the Merseyside area by dozens of people. Many of these witnesses later admitted that Bulger looked distressed. Some even saw the older boys punch and kick the two-year-old. But most did nothing, and those that stopped and questioned the James Bulger killer soon enough let them go on their way to ultimately murder the toddler. First, of course, John Venables and Robert Thompson had to snatch Bulger away from his mother in the midst of a busy shopping mall. The boys ended up at the New Strand Shopping Center in Boodle, near Liverpool, on the afternoon of February 12th after having skipped school that day. At the mall, James killers wandered from shop to shop, stealing anything they could get their hands on then tossing their stolen booty down escalators, just for the fun of it. At some point, for reasons that still remain unclear more than two decades later, Venables and Thompson decided to steal someone's child. After they were arrested, each blamed the other. James was not the first child that the pair tried to abduct. In fact, that first child nearly became the victim. Inside a TJ Hughes department store, a woman noticed that two boys were trying to get her kid's attention. Moments later, her three-year-old daughter and two-year-old son were missing. The mother quickly found her daughter, but there was no sign of her son. Frantically, she asked her daughter where he was. Gone outside with the boy, she said. The woman began calling for her son and ran outside, where she found Venables and Thompson beckoning the boy to follow them. When Venables saw the mother, they told the boy to go back to her, and they vanished. Mere luck had saved the boy and sealed James Bulger's terrible fate. Soon after the aborted abduction, Venables and Thompson were loitering around a snack kiosk, hoping to steal candy when they noticed James Bulger by the door of a nearby butcher's shop. With Bulger's mother, Denise, momentarily distracted, they got the toddler to come with them. Venables took him by the hand. Several shoppers later remembered noticing the trio as they walked through the mall. Sometimes Bulger ran ahead, leaving Venables and Thompson to beckon him back with calls of come on, baby. They were caught by a surveillance camera leaving the mall at 3.42 p.m. By this time, Denise was panicking. She had thought that her son was by her side as she was placing her order at the butcher shop. But when she looked down, he was gone. She quickly found mall security personnel and described her son and what he was wearing. At first, they announced the boy's name over the mall's loudspeakers. By 4, 15 p.m., however, there was no sign of James Bulger and he was reported missing to the local police station. Meanwhile, after Venables, Thompson, and Bulger had left the mall, the toddler began crying out for his mother. The older boys ignored him and continued down to a secluded area near a canal. At the canal, they dropped Bulger on his head and left him on the ground, crying. A woman passing by noticed Bulger but did nothing. Venables and Thompson then called for Bulger to come. And still, he followed. By now, however, his forehead was bruised and cut, causing Venables and Thompson to pull the hood of the toddler's anorak over his head to try and hide the injury. Nevertheless, additional passers-by could still see the partially covered forehead injury, and one person even saw a tear on Bulger's cheek, but no one did anything. The older boys then meandered around Liverpool past shops, 
buildings, and parking lots. They walked down one of Liverpool's busiest streets. Some witnesses later remembered seeing Bulger laughing, while others remembered seeing him resisting and even screaming for his mother. One person even saw Thompson kick Bulger in the ribs for resisting. Still, no one did anything. Soon after, a woman saw Thompson punch Bulger and shake him. But she pulled her curtains and blocked out the scene. But one bystander provided a glimmer of hope, however fleeting. For James Bulger, with evening approaching, an elderly woman saw Bulger crying, noticed his injuries, and approached the trio to inquire what was wrong. But the two ten-year-olds said, we just found him at the bottom of the hill. Apparently satisfied with their explanation, the woman simply told the two boys to take the toddler down to the nearby Walton Lane police station. She called out to them once more as they walked away, but they did not look back. She was concerned, but another woman standing nearby said she'd heard James laughing moments ago. And so both assumed nothing was wrong. Later that night, one of the women saw the news that Bulger was missing. She phoned the police and expressed regret for not doing something. Not long after the elderly woman sent the boys on their way, Bulger was almost rescued yet again. A woman concerned for the toddler told Venables and Thompson that she would take the child to the police station herself. But when she asked another woman nearby to look after her daughter while she did so, that woman refused because her dog did not like children. And so Bulger slipped away from safety once again. Venables, Thompson, and Bulger then walked into two different stores, where they interacted with both shopkeepers who, though suspicious of the older boys, let them go. Then Venables and Thompson came upon two older boys that they knew. These boys asked who the toddler was, and Venables replied that he was Thompson's brother, and that they were taking him home. Then they arrived at the railway. The boys hesitated, perhaps reconsidering what they were about to do, and did briefly turn away from the embankment. But then John Venables and Robert Thompson turned back toward the privacy of the deserted railway. The brutal torture and murder of James Bulger occurred sometime between 5.45 and 6.30 p.m. Venables and Thompson had brought blue paint stolen from the shopping mall and splashed it in Bulger's left eye. They then kicked him, pummeled him with bricks and stones, and stuffed batteries into his mouth. Finally, the boys hit Bulger over the head with a 22-pound iron bar, which resulted in 10 skull fractures. All in all, Bulger sustained 42 injuries to his face, head, and body. He was so badly battered, authorities later concluded, that there was no way to tell which injury represented the fatal blow. Eventually, Venables and Thompson placed Bulger's dead body. A forensic pathologist later concluded that he was dead at this point, across the train tracks, in hopes of making the whole thing look like an accident, and abandoned the scene before a train came along and severed the toddler in two. The next day, police searched the canal where the boys had been earlier in the afternoon because an eyewitness had reported seeing Bulger there. Other searches were conducted elsewhere, all leading to nothing. With little to go on, Bulger's parents were suspects initially. But when the police eventually saw the CCTV footage from the shopping mall, they could not believe their eyes. Despite the fuzzy footage, it was two small boys that could be seen leading James Bulger, identified from the description of his clothing provided by his mother, to the exit. Once those CCTV images were released to the media, the story went nationwide, and the search for Bulger intensified. When Bulger's father, Ralph, saw that it was just two boys with whom his son had left the mall, he was relieved. I looked at Denise and smiled with relief. He's gonna be all right, Denise, I said. He's with two young kids. He's gonna be all right. The search ended two days after the disappearance, when four children discovered Bulger's body on the railway track, just 200 yards from the nearest police station. All of the instruments used in the attack were found strewn around the area. The iron bar, stones, and bricks all covered in the boy's blood. The stolen tin of blue paint was found nearby. 
With some evidence in hand and the knowledge that the James Bulger killers were likely two children, the police checked nearby schools' absentee lists for the day of the disappearance. This caused various children to be identified as potential killers, with some parents even reporting their own kids. But it was ultimately an anonymous phone call to the police that implicated John Venables and Robert Thompson as the James Bulger killers. The caller told the police that Venables and Thompson were both absent from school on Friday and that they themselves had seen blue paint on the sleeve of Venables' jacket. The police then visited both children's homes and discovered blood on Thompson's shoes and blue paint on Venables' jacket. Despite this evidence, however, Venables and Thompson weren't initially the authorities' prime suspects. Police were focused on other children who already had violent records, and they remained convinced that the two boys from the fuzzy CCTV footage looked 13 or 14, not 10. But during separate police interviews, John Venables and Robert Thompson turned on each other. Over the course of interviews lasting several days, Venables eventually confessed. I did kill him, Venables said. What about his mom? Will you tell her I'm sorry? Robert Thompson, on the other hand, was not such an easy interview. He totally denied everything said Detective Sergeant Phil Roberts. But in the end, he shot himself in the foot by giving me a detailed account of what James Bulger was wearing. Nevertheless, throughout the whole process, Thompson remained chillingly unfazed, earning him the nickname the boy who did not cry from the press. Venables and Thompson were both charged. Nine months later, the trial began. Outside the courthouse, people called for the blood of the James Bulger killers. Kill the bastards, people yelled. A life for a life. Popular disgust only intensified when witnesses and the media noted Thompson's cold, seemingly remorseless behavior at trial, compared with Venable's hysterical outbursts. Thus, it was widely assumed that Thompson was the instigator even though psychiatrists and authorities have never been able to reach a conclusion on the boy's motives. But Blake Morrison, the author of As If, A Crime, A Trial, A Question of Childhood, a book on the trial, points out that Venables had a temper and had been known to lose control and had had him some pretty weird things, and it was just as likely that he was the instigator. Moreover, Court-appointed psychiatrists determined that the two boys knew right from wrong and weren't sociopaths, but were nevertheless able to uncover any concrete motives for James Bulger's murder, something no professional has been able to confidently determine even in the years since. Motive aside, both John Venables and Robert Thompson were convicted, making them the youngest to be convicted of that crime in Britain in 250 years. As the jury foreman read the verdict, Venables and Thompson were sitting in an adult court dock that had been altered so that the boys could see over it. Venables and Thompson were then sentenced to serve at Her Majesty's pleasure. As is standard protocol for juvenile offenders convicted of murder or manslaughter, this indefinite sentence has no maximum but does have a minimum to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. In this case, it was just eight years, at which time the boys would be 18. After that point, the James Bulger killers were to be assessed and, if they weren't deemed to be a danger to society, released. By all accounts, Venables and Thompson showed no violent or aberrant behavior in prison, but instead served their time for the James Bulger murder quietly and without incident. So, when the eight years were up in 2001, both boys were released. Upon their release, John Venables and Robert Thompson were given new identities and granted legal anonymity for life due to the public fury that surrounded their trial and the danger of citizens hunting down the infamous James Bulger killers in order to take vengeance. To date, no significant attempts at vengeance have been made. James Bulger's mother, Denise, was able to locate Robert Thompson in 2004, but was paralyzed with hatred and could not confront him. Today, while Thompson is believed to be assimilating back into society and living a quiet life, 
the same cannot be said of Venables. In 2010, he was imprisoned for downloading images depicting various kinds of sexual abuse being inflicted upon male toddlers. He became eligible for parole in 2013, at which time Ralph Bolger told the parole board that he couldn't forgive his son's killers and that Venables should not be released. Sometimes you feel like you're having a heart attack, he said at the time. It's just a big knot in your chest, and that's been there since day one. Nevertheless, Venables was released. But in November 2017, John Venables was again imprisoned when more child abuse images and a pedophile manual that provided instructions on having sex with kids were discovered on his computer. Joan was sentenced to three years and four months in prison, not far from half the amount of time he served for joining Robert Thompson in perpetrating the murder of James Bulger a quarter century before. Venables made headlines again in September 2023 when he was granted a parole hearing to take place in November. James Bulger's immediately spoke out, saying once more that Venables should spend the rest of his life in prison for the shocking crime he committed that tragic day in 1993. Mary Vincent was a 15-year-old runaway heading to visit her grandfather in California when she accepted a ride from a man named Lawrence Singleton in September 1978, and it changed her life forever. Singleton seemed friendly enough at first, but the Fay aide didn't last long. Soon after picking up young Vincent, Singleton assaulted her, raped her multiple times, and then cut her arms off before dumping her into the Del Puerto Canyon. That should have been the end for Vincent, but the teenager managed to stumble three miles to the nearest road, where she was discovered and taken to the hospital. She had survived a harrowing ordeal, but her story was only beginning. Mary Vincent grew up in Las Vegas, but she ran away from home at the age of 15. She moved to California with her boyfriend, where the two lived out of a car. However, he was soon arrested for raping another teenage girl and Vincent was on her own. On September 29, 1978, she decided to hitchhike nearly 400 miles to Corona, California, where her grandfather lived. When 50-year-old Lawrence Singleton pulled over and offered Vincent a ride, she naively accepted, as he seemed like a friendly older man. Not long after climbing into Singleton's van, Mary Vincent realized she may have made a mistake. He asked her if she was sick after she sneezed, and then put his hand on her neck to check her temperature. However, Vincent thought that he was simply being kind, and she soon fell asleep. When she awoke, however, she noticed they were traveling the wrong way on the road. She grew uneasy and found a sharp stick in the vehicle. Vincent pointed it at Singleton and ordered him to turn around. Singleton claimed he was just an honest man who made a mistake and started driving back in the right direction, but he soon pulled over to take a bathroom break. Vincent stepped out of the vehicle to stretch her legs and bent over to tie her shoe, and then Singleton hit her in the head and dragged her into the back of the van. He raped her while telling her that he would kill her if she screamed. As Vincent begged Singleton to let her go, he suddenly said, You want to be free? I'll set you free." He then grabbed a hatchet and cut off both of the girl's arms below the elbow and stated, "'Okay, now you're free.'" Singleton pushed Mary Vincent down an embankment and left her to die in a concrete pipe. But against all odds, she somehow managed to survive. Naked and falling in and out of consciousness, Mary Vincent managed to crawl out of the canyon and walk three miles back to Interstate 5. She held what remained of her arms straight up so that she wouldn't lose as much blood. The first car that Vincent saw turned around and sped away, frightened by the sight of her. Fortunately, a second car stopped and drove her to a nearby hospital. After intense surgery to save her life, she was fitted with prosthetic arms, a change that would take years of physical therapy for her to adjust to. She also underwent intensive psychotherapy to help her cope with the trauma she'd experienced. I'd have been lead dancer at the Lido de Paris in Las Vegas, 
Vincent said in 1997. Then Hawaii and Australia? I'm serious. I was really good on my feet. But when this happened, they had to take some parts out of my leg just to save my right arm. Thankfully, Vincent was able to provide such a detailed description of Lawrence Singleton to authorities that he was quickly identified by the police sketch and arrested. Mary Vincent testified against her attacker in court, and as she left the stand, Singleton reportedly whispered to her, I'll finish this job if it takes me the rest of my life. Ultimately, Singleton was found guilty of rape, kidnapping, and attempted murder. However, he served just over eight years in prison and was released on parole for good behavior. From that point on, Vincent lived her life in fear, worried that Singleton would follow through on his promise one day. Tragically, he did, but Vincent wasn't the one on the receiving end. By the late 1990s, Singleton had moved to Florida as he couldn't find a community in California willing to accept him. On February 19, 1997, he lured a sex worker named Roxanne Hayes into his home and violently murdered her. Neighbors heard Hayes' screams and called the police, but it was too late. Officers arrived to find her body on the floor, covered in blood and stab wounds. Mary Vincent flew from California to Florida when she learned of Singleton's arrest to testify on Roxanne Hayes' behalf. In court, she detailed her own story to highlight just how depraved a man Lawrence Singleton was and why he should be sentenced to death. I was raped, she told the jury. I had my arms cut off. He used a hatchet. He left me to die. Singleton was sentenced to death on April 14, 1998. He spent three years in prison awaiting his execution, but he died from cancer at the age of 74 while still on death row, Mary Vincent could live in peace for the first time in decades. In the years following the attack, Vincent wasn't sure she would ever live a normal life. She'd struggled, gotten married and then divorced, had two children and eventually founded the Mary Vincent Foundation to help other survivors of violent crimes. He destroyed everything about me, she once said of Singleton, my way of thinking my way of life, holding on to innocence and I'm still doing everything I can to hold on. In 2003, she told the Seattle Post Intelligencer, I've broken bones thanks to my nightmares. I've jumped up and dislocated my shoulder, just trying to get out of bed. I've cracked ribs and smashed my nose. Eventually, however, Vincent discovered art and it helped her cope with the trauma of what she'd been through. She couldn't afford to buy high-end prosthetic arms, so she created her own using parts from refrigerators and stereo systems. And she taught herself to draw and paint using her inventions. Before the attack, Mary Vincent stated, I couldn't draw a straight line. Even with a ruler, I would mess it up. This is something that woke up after the attack, and my artwork has inspired me and given me self-esteem. Toolbox killers Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris killed five teenage girls in just five months and recorded some of their horrific torture and murder sessions for their own amusement. The depraved duo became known as the Toolbox Killers. Using devices for torturing their victims more commonly found in the garage, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris were a sadistically brutal pair of serial rapists and killers stalking teenage girls across the Los Angeles area for five dark months in 1979. From their van, they picked up hitchhikers, driving them to secluded spots where they could indulge in their most gruesome rape and torture fantasies. Their crimes, particularly the Halloween torture and murder of Shirley Ledford, would cause FBI profiler John Douglas to classify Bittaker as the most disturbing individual for whom he has ever created a criminal profile. Finally arrested after a sickening five-month murder spree, the prosecutor in their trial would similarly describe the events of that Halloween night as one of the most shocking, brutal cases in the history of American crime. Lawrence Sigmund Bittaker was born on September 27, 1940, 
and adopted as an infant. By his early teens, he was sent to the California Youth Authority for car theft. Released at 19, he never saw his adoptive parents again. Over the next 15 years, Bittaker was in and out of prison for assault, burglary, and grand theft. He was diagnosed by a prison psychiatrist as being highly manipulative and as having considerable concealed hostility. In 1974, Bittaker stabbed a supermarket employee, barely missing his heart, and was convicted of assault with a deadly weapon, then sentenced to California Men's Colony in San Luis Obispo. Roy Lewis Norris was born on February 5, 1948, and lived with his family occasionally, but was more often placed in the care of foster families. Norris allegedly suffered neglect by these families, and sexual abuse by at least one. Norris dropped out of high school, briefly joined the Navy, and was then honorably discharged with a diagnosis of severe schizoid personality by military psychologists. In May 1970, Norris was on bail for another offense when he violently attacked a female student with a rock on the campus of San Diego State University. Charged for the offense, Norris served almost five years at Atascadero State Hospital, classified as a mentally disordered sex offender. Norris was released on probation in 1975, declared of no further danger to others. Three months later, he raped a 27-year-old woman after dragging her into some bushes. In 1976, Norris was incarcerated in the same prison as Bittaker, bringing the future toolbox killers together. By 1978, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris had become close prison acquaintances, sharing a perverse obsession with sexual violence against women. Norris told Bittaker his biggest thrill was overwhelming women with fear and terror. And Bittaker confided that if he ever raped a woman, he would kill her to avoid leaving behind a witness, fantasizing about sexually assaulting and murdering teenage girls. Both men pledged that they would reunite once released and planned to murder one girl of each teenage year, 13 through 19. Bittaker was released in November 1978, and Norris followed on January 1979. Within a month, Norris had raped a woman. Then, as promised, Norris received a letter from Bittaker, and the pair met and began to put their twisted prison plan into action. Abducting teenage girls discreetly wouldn't be easy. They needed a suitable vehicle. Bittaker proposed a van. Norris put up the cash. And in February 1979, Bittaker purchased a silver 1977 GMC Vandora. The passenger side sliding door would allow them to pull up to potential victims without having to slide the door all the way. They nicknamed their van the Murder Mac. The pair picked up over 20 hitchhikers from February to June 1979, but didn't assault these girls. Rather, these were practice runs. Scouting for secure locations, in late April 1979, they found an isolated fire road in the San Gabriel Mountains. Bittaker snapped the lock on the entry gate with a crowbar and replaced it with his own. According to the book Alone with the Devil by courtroom psychiatrist Ronald Markman, in final preparations, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris created a toolbox for torture. They bought plastic tape, pliers, rope, knives, an ice pick, as well as a Polaroid camera and tape recorder. Then the toolbox killers were ready to indulge in their sadism. Between late June and September 1979, the pair abducted, raped, and killed four teenage girls, ranging in age from 13 to 17. They drove their victims to the Mountain Fire Road, where they inflicted pain from their toolbox assortment the girls' screams forever lost in the mountain canyons. After realizing manual strangulation wasn't as easy as the movies, Bittaker started using wire from a coat hanger tightened with pliers. The depravity increased for Andre Hall, their second victim. Up in the mountains, Bittaker inserted an ice pick through her ear, then tried the other side and finally stomped on the handle until it snapped. Hall, miraculously still alive, 
was finally strangled by Bittaker. And when the pair were finished with her, they threw her over the mountainside. The level of terror, pain, and sexual assault was escalating for Bittaker and Norris victims. The pair's evil would only be surpassed in later years by serial killers Leonard Lake and Charles. On September 2nd, two younger girls were snatched hitchhiking. 15-year-old Jacqueline Gilliam was continually raped by both men as Bittaker recorded her horror. Bittaker took photos of her in various states of naked distress, tormenting Gilliam by asking for reasons why he shouldn't kill her. Meanwhile, 13-year-old Lee Lamp was left untouched under sedation. After two days of terror, Bittaker thrust his ice pick through Gilliam's ear, then strangled her with his coat hanger and pliers. The toolbox killers then roused Lamp and bludgeoned her on the head with a sledgehammer as she stepped from the van. Bittaker choked her and Norris struck her repeatedly with a hammer, with both girls' bodies finally thrown down a ravine. The repeated rape unspeakable brutality and horrific torture that Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris inflicted on 16-year-old Shirley Ledford was all recorded for their sick enjoyment. Late on Halloween night, 1979, Ledford left her restaurant shift toward a party in a colleague's car. From a gas station, Ledford decided to walk or hitchhike home rather than go to the party and she may have entered the van after recognizing Bittaker as a customer from the restaurant. With Bittaker's tape recorder running, Ledford was immediately bound and gagged. For two hours, Ledford was subjected to agonizing trauma as the pair took turns alternately driving the van, raping and torturing her. Bittaker repeatedly beat her with a sledgehammer, twisted, squeezed, and tore at her breasts and vagina with pliers as both men encouraged Ledford to scream louder for the tape. After Norris reigned, repeated hammer blows to her elbow, then strangled her with a coat hanger and pliers, Ledford can be heard begging for death. Do it, just kill me. When Bittaker and Norris had finished with her, Shirley Ledford's body was left in a grisly display on the front lawn of a nearby house. Roy Norris revealed the pair's rapes and murders to another rapist he had been incarcerated with, including Ledford's murder, the only toolbox victim yet to be found. Norris also confided that another woman had been raped by them, but released afterward. The man notified police via his attorney, and investigators matched reports of several teenage girls reported missing over the previous five months to Norris's claims. There was also the September 30 report of a young woman dragged into a GMC van and raped by two men in their mid-30s. The rape victim was shown mugshots and positively identified Bittaker and Norris. Norris was arrested for a parole violation on November 20, 1979, with Bittaker arrested for rape at his motel the same day. The search of Norris's apartment revealed a bracelet of Ledford's while in Bittaker's motel room. Police found numerous photographs and other incriminating evidence. Investigators seized and searched Bittaker's silver van, where they seized several items, including several cassette tapes, one of which contained Ledford's torture. Ledford's mother confirmed it was her daughter on the recording, screaming, pleading, and begging for her life. Investigators confirmed the voices on the tape belonged to Bittaker and Norris. Norris initially denied all accusations, then faced with the evidence, confessed to five murders. Norris, seeking a plea deal to testify against Bittaker, took investigators into the San Gabriel Mountains, where the skulls of Gilliam and Lamp were eventually found. Roy Norris plead guilty, sparing him the death penalty, and on May 7, 1980, was sentenced to 45 years to life with parole eligibility from 2010, Lawrence Bittaker's trial began on January 19, 1981. Norris testified about their shared history and the five murders committed by them. Introducing photographic evidence, a witness from Bittaker's motel testified that he had been shown naked photos of distressed girls by Bittaker and told one of them had been killed. Another 17-year-old girl testified that Bittaker had played her a cassette tape, 
apparently the rape of Gilliam, according to court records. Then, the 17-minute audio of Shirley Ledford was played for the jury, and many cried, burying their heads in their hands. Prosecutor Stephen Kay was reduced to tears, but Bittaker sat through the whole thing smiling. Norris had testified Bittaker that amused himself by playing the tape while driving in the weeks before arrest. On February 5th, Bittaker testified himself, denying rape and murder, stating he paid the girls for sex and permission to take their photographs. In closing, Prosecutor Kay told the jury, if the death penalty is not appropriate in this case, then when will it ever be? On February 17th, the jury found Bittaker guilty of five counts of first-degree murder and several other charges, and on February 19th, Bittaker was sentenced to death. On death row after various appeals and stays of execution, Bittaker never expressed any remorse for his crimes but did seem to revel in his celebrity. Autographing items with the name Pliers Bittaker. He died in San Quentin State Prison on December 13, 2019. Norris died in prison of natural causes on February 24, 2020. In the aftermath of the toolbox killer's savagery, Stephen Kay reported recurring nightmares. He would be rushing to Bittaker's van to prevent harm coming to the girls, but would always get there too late. Meanwhile, Shirley Ledford's tape is retained by the FBI and it's used to this day to train FBI agents about the reality of torture and murder. On April 16, 1996, James Patterson Smith contacted Greater Manchester Police to say that his teenage girlfriend, Kelly Ann Bates, had accidentally drowned in the tub. Though he claimed he tried to resuscitate her, she was dead at the age of just 17. However, when police arrived at Smith's house, the scene was far worse than anything they could have ever expected. Not only was Bates dead, but her blood was found all over the house, and she'd clearly suffered dozens of gruesome injuries before her drowning. The authorities quickly arrested James Patterson Smith and his story fell apart almost immediately. Soon, the post-mortem examination showed that Smith had brutally tortured Kellyanne Bates for weeks before she finally died. As the pathologist later said, in my career, I have examined almost 600 victims of homicide, but I have never come across injuries so extensive. This is the disturbing story of Kellyanne Bates' murder at the hands of James Patterson Smith. One day, Margaret Bates returned home to her house in Hattersley, England to find her 16-year-old daughter, Kelly Ann, standing in the kitchen. Unbeknownst to her mother, Kelly Ann had brought her boyfriend home for the first time. Next came the sound of footsteps on the stairs as the boyfriend, James Patterson Smith, walked into the room. Margaret was shocked to find that Smith was in his mid-40s. Obviously, no mother would be happy to learn that their daughter was dating someone so much older than she was. But for Margaret, it went further than that. There was something deeply disturbing about Smith. This wasn't the man I wanted for my daughter. I vividly recall seeing our bread knife in the kitchen and wanting to pick it up and stab him in the back. She said in a later interview, Margaret would later regret her decision not to stab Smith then and there because her daughter's relationship with James Patterson Smith would soon end with him torturing and killing her so brutally that the court provided the jurors at his trial with counseling afterward. The couple had met in 1993, when Kellyanne Bates was just 14, and they'd been keeping the relationship largely secret from her mother until that fateful moment in the kitchen. In November 1995, not long after the meeting in the kitchen, Kelly Ann moved in with the unemployed Smith in nearby Gorton. Though skeptical of the decision, her parents agreed on the condition that she keep in regular contact. But over the next few months, their once outgoing daughter grew withdrawn. And when she stopped by for a rare visit, her parents noticed bruises on her arms. James Patterson Smith had a long history of abusing the women he lived with, 
His first marriage ended in accusations of physical violence, and other women Smith had dated told similar stories. He even once tried to drown a 15-year-old girlfriend. Smith was no different with Kellyanne Bates and regularly beat her, but after a few months, the abuse escalated to a terrifying new level. The true extent of the abuse only became clear on April 16, 1996, when Smith walked into the Gorton police station and said that he'd accidentally killed Kellyanne Bates after their argument while she was in the bath caused her to drown. How exactly he framed this as an accident to police remains unclear. But when the authorities soon found Kellyanne's body inside Smith's house, her injuries told a far darker story. The pathologist who examined the body found more than 150 injuries inflicted over a period of at least a month. In the weeks leading up to her death, Smith was starving Bates, and even kept her tied to a radiator by her hair. She had been burned with a hot iron, strangled, and stabbed dozens of times in the legs, torso, and mouth. Smith had also disfigured her by cutting at her scalp, face, and genitals with assorted tools, including pruning shears. He'd even gouged out her eyes at least five days before he finally killed her by drowning her in the tub. The case went to trial, during which the prosecutors laid out the torture Bates had endured for the jury. The physical pain would have been intense, one prosecutor said, causing anguish and torment to the point of mental breakdown and collapse. At the trial, other women that Smith had abused came forward to paint a picture of a misogynistic man who was obsessively jealous and turned to violence to control others. Meanwhile, Smith argued that he was the real victim. He claimed that Bates drove him to kill her by taunting him. She put me through hell, winding me up, he said. He even argued that she inflicted some of her injuries herself to make him look bad. But the jury didn't buy it and quickly found 49-year-old James Patterson Smith guilty of murdering Kellyanne Bates. On November 19, 1997, he was sentenced to a minimum of 20 years in prison. Some accounts say 25, where he remains to this day. As for Margaret Bates, she still thinks back to that moment in the kitchen when she first met Smith. It was a bizarre thought. She said of her desire to kill him right there. I would never normally think of anything so violent. And now I wonder whether it was some sort of sixth sense. Junko Furuta was just 17 years old when she was raped, beaten, and killed by four teenage boys in 1980s Japan. As far as Shinji Minato's parents were concerned, Junko Furuta was their son's girlfriend the pretty young girl hung around with their son so often that it seemed as if she were living at their home. Even when they began to suspect that her perpetual presence wasn't always consensual, they labored under the delusion that everything was fine. After all, they feared their son's violent tendencies and his friend's connections to the Yakuza, a powerful organized crime syndicate in Japan. But as far as Shinji Minato and his friends, Hiroshi Miyano, Joe Ogura, and Yasushi Watanabe were concerned. Junko Furuta was their captive, their sex slave, and their punching bag for 44 days straight. And tragically, on her last day of horrific torture, she would become their murder victim. Junko Furuta was born in Misato, Saitama, Japan, in 1971. And up until her kidnapping at age 17, she was a normal girl. Furuta was known for being pretty, bright, and getting good grades at Yashio Minami High School. Despite her good girl reputation, she didn't drink, smoke, or use drugs. She was quite popular at school and seemingly had a bright future ahead of her. But everything changed in November 1988. At the time, her future kidnapper, Hiroshi Miyano, was known as the school bully, often bragging about his connections to the Yakuza. According to some of their classmates, Miyano had developed somewhat of a crush on Furuta and was enraged when she turned him down. After all, 
No one had ever dared to reject him, especially after he told them of his Yakuza friends. A few days after the rejection, Miyano and Minato were hanging around a local park in Misato, preying on innocent women. As experienced gang rapists, Miyano and Minato were experts at spotting potential targets. Around 8.30 p.m., the boys noticed Junko Furuta on her bicycle. At the time, she was on her way home from her job. Minato kicked Furuta off of her bike, creating a diversion, at which point Miyano stepped in, pretending to be an innocent and concerned bystander. After helping her up, he asked her if she wanted an escort home, which Furuta unwittingly accepted. She never saw her loved ones again. Miyano led Furuta to an abandoned warehouse, where he told her of his Yakuza connections and raped her, threatening to kill her and her family if she made a sound. He then took her to a park where Minato, Ogura, and Watanabe were waiting. There, the other boys also raped her. Then, they smuggled her into a home that was owned by Minato's family. Though Furuta's parents called the police and reported their daughter missing, the boys made sure they wouldn't go looking for her, forcing her to call home and say that she had run away and was staying with a friend. Whenever Minato's parents were around, Furuta was forced to pose as his girlfriend, though they eventually realized that something wasn't right. Unfortunately, the threat of the Yakuza coming after them was enough to keep them quiet, and for 44 days, Minato's parents lived in alarming ignorance of the real-life horror story that was unfolding in their own home. Over the course of those 44 days, Junko Furuta was raped over 400 times by Miyano and his friends, as well as other boys and men that the four captors knew. While torturing her, they would insert iron bars, scissors, skewers, fireworks, and even a lit light bulb into her vagina and anus, destroying her internal anatomy, which left her unable to defecate or urinate properly. When they weren't raping her, the boys forced her to do other terrible things, like eating live cockroaches, masturbating in front of them, and drinking her own urine. Her body, still very much alive at that point, was hung from the ceiling and beaten with golf clubs bamboo sticks, and iron rods. Her eyelids and genitals were burned with cigarettes, lighters, and hot wax. And the torture didn't stop until Furuta was dead. One of the most tragic things about Junko Furuta's agonizing torture and eventual murder is that it all could have been prevented. Twice, the police were alerted to Furuta's condition, and they failed to intervene both times. The first time, a boy who had been invited over to the Minato house by Miyano went home after seeing Furuta and told his brother about what was happening. The brother then decided to tell his parents, who contacted the police. The authorities showed up at the Minato residence, but were assured by the family that there was no girl inside. The answer was clearly satisfactory enough for the police, as they never returned to the home. The second time, it was Furuta herself who called the cops. But before she was able to say anything, the boys discovered her. When the police called back, Miyano assured them that the prior call had been a mistake. The authorities never followed up again. The boys then punished Furuta for calling the police, dousing her legs in lighter fluid, and setting her on fire. On January 4, 1989, Junko Furuta's captors finally murdered her. The boys allegedly became enraged when she beat them at a game of mahang and tortured her to death. Scared of being charged with murder, they dumped her body in a 55-gallon drum, filled it with concrete, and dropped it on a cement truck. And for a while, they thought they would never be caught. Two weeks later, the police arrested Miyano and Ogura on a separate gang rape charge. During Miyano's interrogation, the police mentioned an open murder investigation. Believing that the authorities were referring to the murder of Junko Furuta and that Ogura must have confessed to the crime, Miyano told the police where they could find Furuta's body. In the end, the case that the police had been referencing had been unrelated to Furuta, and Miyano had unwittingly turned himself in for her murder. 
Within days, all four boys were in custody. But despite the mountain of evidence against them and their grisly torture of Junko Furuta, the boys received shockingly light sentences. Hiroshi Miyano was sentenced to 20 years. Shinji Minato received a term of five to nine years. Joe Ogura was sentenced to five to 10 years. And Yasushi Watanabe received a term of five to seven years. Since they were teenagers at the time of Junko Furuta's murder, their youth was linked to their light sentences. Though it is widely believed that their connections to the Yakuza also had something to do with it. Had the case been heard elsewhere, or had the boys been just a couple of years older, they would have likely been dealt capital punishments. Instead, all four of Furuta's killers were eventually released from prison. It's believed that Watanabe is the only one who has not reoffended since his release. To this day, many in Japan feel that justice has not been served in Furuta's case. And tragically, it doesn't seem like that will ever happen. If you enjoyed the video, please show your support by subscribing and liking the video and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any future uploads.